Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1 and by 1M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator for startups in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. In support of that mission, we've been doing these free mentoring roundtables for a long time. We started with an experiment back in the fall of 2008, and this today is our 484th session. Over 150,000 entrepreneurs from around the world have participated. The event is being recorded. Recordings of every single prior session is available on our 1M 1M Roundtables YouTube channel. It's a great learning material. Now, a lot of people have time, and uh, you have time to learn. So this may be a good learning material, easy to listen to, and you will learn a lot. You can also learn through our Twitter feed. We publish a lot of enriching material through the two Twitter handles, at 1M by 1M and on my personal handle, Romana. And if you're live tweeting today, please use hashtag 1M1M. You are very welcome to weigh in today and in every one of these sessions. These are roundtables. They're not broadcast. We do have scheduled programming at the beginning of the, of the show, but then we also want you to participate as much as possible. So the call-in numbers are on your screen. I will put that up later in the program when we are ready for you to call in. We're going to start today's session with something very different from what we normally do at these sessions. Our programming is almost entirely focused on entrepreneurs and investors discussing uh, you know, different investment strategies, investment pieces, as well as entrepreneur pitches. We will do that, but today I have invited Dr. Brahmar Mukherjee from University of Michigan. She's a biostatistician and a chair of the biostatistics department, a professor of epidemiology, and professor of global public health at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. This is incredibly uh, timely, and I happened to read about Brummer's work in, in some, I always kind of do a little research every day or every other day on what's happening in India by way of coronavirus, uh, you know, statistics, measures, uh, reporting, news, etc. And, and her name came up, so I went and looked her up, and I said, oh, she's the perfect person for us to have um, listen, hear from here today, and learn about what is on every one of our minds timeline and what can we, you know, what predictions can we derive out of the situation. Now, of course, it's very difficult to derive anything, predict anything, but at least people who have knowledge and have methodology are trying to do their best. Ramor, welcome to the show. It's so great to see you, meet you, and have you here. Thank you for agreeing to do this. Thank you, Srimona, for inviting me. It's always a pleasure. So let's start with, um, you know, we are looking at a terrifying situation right now for small businesses, which is our world. You know, the large companies are going to make it. Either they're going to make it on their own or they're going to make it with government bailouts. The airlines are going to get bailouts and so on and so forth. And, and in our industry, the large companies are actually doing very well. They're not struggling. Facebook, Microsoft, these are you know the, the top five technology companies make up most of the S&P 500. So this is not a problem for them particularly. But we are looking at a terrifying situation for small businesses that have very limited runway. They don't have they can't survive on their own for unlimited amounts of time. And in our world, runway equates largely to cash. Unless customers produce revenues or investors infuse funding, companies run out of cash. So how long is the economic freeze going to last? 
And if the vaccine takes 18 months to be in the market, we're looking at 2021 for normalcy to return to the economy. How do you process the timeline question? So uh, thank you, Shramona, for that question. If I could have an answer for that, then probably I will uh, win a million dollars somewhere in some part of the world. So the fact is that we are in uncharted territory for policymaking. And I am not an economist. I am a public health data scientist. So I can project in terms of the cycle of the virus and virus curve. Um, yeah. But I have to say those projections have limitations. But the, this is a question where the two are intrinsically intertwined because you really cannot decouple the public health component from the economic component. So how to come up with an approach so that uh, public health compromises probably a little bit with suboptimal mitigation as we come out of the lockdown and then we charter a path forward for economic recovery as well. So we cannot, it is very clear that we cannot shut everything down. Lockdown is not a solution for those 18 months. So we have to figure out how to really survive and sustain as a society, as a holistic system where public health is there, societal component is there, families, how families are functioning with, with distress. Because after yeah, all, health. yeah. So after mental health and when you are cooped up uh, in a home and with the, there are a, even from India, where most of my work has been, uh, there are several reports, very disturbing news of domestic violence increasing during this period yeah. of time. So mm -hmm. all of the social consequences and confluences coming together as, at us. So you have to really think about from a more holistic perspective what is sustainable. So I think from a workplace point of view, and I can think about like as an educator, also we have similar situations. If you cannot yes. really get students in a classroom, how is an university sustainable? So we have seen hiring freeze, salary freeze, no um, non-essential travel, uh, every restriction being imposed on universities all across the United States, particularly I, I, am, I, I know the situation in Michigan. So everybody will have to live under very modest means and get through this time. I think that's understood in all sectors of business, including education. If you think about students not being able to go to a classroom, is this just like a really devastating consequence for educators and also for learners? So we are figuring out that how to, so I don't want to be this bleak that we are going to give up because uh, humanity has never given up. Uh, if you think about World War II, that's when Alan Turing built the Turing machine, which is giving all these tech companies that you're seeing. So the inventions that happen during a wartime science can actually advance humanity because we are all so focused in inventions right now and innovations. So I, I want to be a little bit more hopeful that there are new technologies, new science, which are going to come out of this period because we are... Uh, back against the wall fighting back, I think is going to really advance things and investments in the period. So the strategy is how do we sustain this time period? So how do you so, collaborate? Let me ask you a question actually that you brought up. Um, you know, it's a good segue into an area which I think is very ripe for innovation innovation has been happening. It's not like innovation hasn't been happening, but it's, it's certainly there's a long way to go is distance learning. Right now we're all practicing distance learning. Even, you know, people who are past universities are doing distance learning. Um, you know, I religiously every day I open up my Duolingo and, and study French. So that's just, you know, one variety of distance learning, but I think, um, the, the parts of the distance learning ecosystem that are not working so well are the kids' education. I think um, the elementary education is not working very well, so there is clearly stuff to do there and innovation to create there. On the higher education side, distance learning is better uh, positioned. What is, your, what is your analysis of, uh, since you are in academia and you are facing this head on, what is your uh, what is your read? Yes, so a so, couple of things. One is it is very tied to the timeline as well. So 
I, I do think that there has been tremendous innovation to so the entire university hats off to all the educators and learners all across the world. We converted uh, in our university, for example, I chaired this department, my faculty converted within a period of three days into remote mm -hmm. teaching. And then they figured yeah. out, you know, math is really hard to teach online because you need that real time working out of equations. But everybody figured out how to really plug in their tablet and iPads to blue jeans and write equations and project them. And we could have done that before too in our office hours and other times that we are lazy, but we didn't do it. But within a period of one day, we figured out how to do that. So, uh, and then we figured out how to keep people engaged. That's the thing, right? If you are continuously lecturing, people are going to, if you, they're not in a classroom, in, even in a classroom, they get distracted. So when they're on yeah. their own in their home, they're just going to play it on and enroll, have their video and the microphone off and just tune out. So we figured out ways to use things like poll everywhere, which is an internet based polling system where you ask questions and students text you and um, or they can go to a website and actually um, put their down their answers. And they also can type text so you can see the word cloud. So one of my, um, my colleagues started this every class with, tell me something good. And then their word, word cloud will evolve with all the sentiments and the feelings in the classroom. So I think this is also an interesting thing. We have to look at the positive side that this type of education has given learners who are quiet a voice because your identity is not revealed to this uh, or uh, sharing this information and also the chat function. People who will normally not talk raise their hands. I see this in a faculty meeting that silent spectators and the audience, everybody has a voice because you feel more comfortable using the chat function. So, mm -hmm. but I have to reiterate that Michigan is not just Ann Arbor. Michigan is also Detroit where there are people and students who do not have the bandwidth in terms of their internet connection. So this, we are forgetting, I think, that we are really talking about issues and problems, and I am, a, I am to blame as well, uh, which are uh, relevant to certain segment of the population. We have no idea what the situation in other part of the have. So this coronavirus pandemic, for me at least, underscored even more the demarcation between the haves and have nots. So the yeah. learning, yeah, the learning outcomes are not on that, I, I have a couple of comments. It's actually a very important point to underscore. Uh, the digital divide is becoming very stark at the moment, on the one hand, which is on the, especially on the learning side. And the second digital divide is the, the digital economy versus the physical economy, right? The digital economy can function. Our universe can function. We have the luxury of thinking of higher order problems Whereas the physical economy, you know, people's livelihoods are uh, jeopardized and, and their problems are, are much, you know, much more fundamental. So um, on that, one of the innovations, policies, infrastructure investments that we hope will come out of this on the other end of the coronavirus pandemic is, a, you know, broader deployment of free 5G bandwidth access. You know, if you don't have bandwidth access, you cannot do distance learning. And, and the, the segments you are referring to don't have bandwidth access, they don't have computer access. So, so that's, that's one area where, you know, after the war, highways were built. Well, we need to build digital highways so that people have access. And uh, however, on the, on the physical economy side, Going back to timeline, for us, you know, the decisions are when do we launch products, when, do, when does demand come back, when do we start, when, when are we able to close deals, stuff like that. Those are the concerns of the digital economy. When, when does funding start becoming available again, etc. The physical economy, like actually going to work in a factory, going to, you know, Right now, a lot of farm produce is rotting in the fields. They're not getting picked. There's a whole, you know, series of stuff that are going on that need to be addressed that are 
you know, much darker. So, uh, which leads me to another question that I want to explore with you is, um, what, what is data science teaching us through this process about evolution? Clearly, you know, in terms of survival of the fittest, the digital economy is emerging to be a lot fitter than the physical economy. How do you process this? And, and what, what is data science telling us? So I, I, I will pretty thank you for that question. This is a very broad philosophical question, but I think we can only uh, think about and uh, surmise that what some of these uh, problems are and how is data science helping us. So first of all, I think data science, as you, your first question was, is helping us to understand the flow of the virus curve. And I have to uh, reiterate that we see in the media that models are changing very uh, abruptly. Like overnight, the projections are changing. So all statistical models and epidemiologic projection models are really wrinkled with assumptions. So uh, one peak and one surge in cases can actually really change things. And this is tremendous need to update these models daily. So for example, for India, we built an app where um, it is automated. Every day the death count and the case count come in, the projections update. Because just stop it on one particular day and do projections and do this academic work of writing a paper and forgetting about it does not really solve the problem here. So we are really having to figure out this uh, data adaptive and continuously updating automatic solutions and computational solutions. So in Michigan, I, learn, I, I really learned the advanced computing system because we have models for every state in India and all of India, sorry. Um, so I, I definitely uh, want to really want to mention that, that that is something that the continuous adaptation to the challenges is something that we really need to be mindful of. Um, another thing that, so it is telling us about the timeline. We know that, that you know, the, this, these prediction models are sort of give, are very good at short-term uh, prediction, not so much in terms of long-term prediction. Um, and so it is telling us that we are in this for a long haul. So we can actually argue about, about the different numbers coming out of these projection models, but what is important is the ultimate message that we are in this for a long haul. There is probably a first peak, which is going to die down, but then there could be a second peak in the fall. So we have to have a long-term strategy in to, instead of a discrete set of tactics. Another thing which I think is very important, which is under, it's really not pointed out that much in media, that how much role data science and um, network models can actually play as businesses are thinking about reopening. So when you are thinking about reopening, as you said, that some of the work can be done digitally, but probably there is some value of face-to-face -face interaction, and that actually keeps the morale and the purpose of an employee up when we are thinking about a long term, because none of us took this job that we are doing from home right now. So if you think about a network model, there are three goals in terms of reopening. One is to how to minimize the spread of the virus, Second, how to retain your core critical functions of an organization. And the third thing is a little altruistic, but still very important. How do you bring meaning and purpose still in your employment? And that could be through virtual engagement, but also what are critical face-to-face -face interactions? So I think you can build network models of a community understanding that what is the person-to-person -person and person-to-object transmission. So for example, coffee makers, coffee, that place is really a place where everybody touches everything. So a solution could be that everybody has their own coffee machine, but still gets together for a virtual coffee hour, right? So these are the little tweaks. At a very micro level, we have to think. The whiteboard, everybody touches it, but probably we give everybody their own personal whiteboard in the classroom. So some some things which still retains but still minimizes transmission, we have to think very creatively and use data there too. And in terms of evolution, that's a very broad question, right? So uh, natural selection and origin of species. I have been reading a lot about science, right? What did people do when the 1918 uh, Spanish flu happened? 
um, where people feeling like this, this agony, this fear, this anxiety, this sense of loss, and where did they find hope? And I think that one thing, so I looked at Michigan, what did the University of Michigan do during the pandemic? So they did not, the Michigan did not close down. Ann Arbor was a city of 18,000 people and we lost 100 lives. And we cannot just look at numbers. These are like people and lost lives. But what people were really uh, sad about is that these other things have gone away from their life, which is orchestra, theater. There was supposed to be a brilliant uh, concert pianist coming and, uh, um, and an opera singer coming. And those were canceled that fall. And we can see in newspaper that people are complaining about that. So I think this thing about controlling the virus the economy, but also how to really keep the human spirit. This should be a part of every strategy because that really helps us. The public has a strong role to play in public health and health is emotional, physical, and you know, just disease oriented health. So uh, I'd say that well, we are adapting. The point that you're raising is, is emotional, physical, and also economic, what all these aspects of life, of human life, you know, broadly characterized as large events, is, is a massive economic segment. And a lot of people's livelihoods depend on that. You know, there is the whole sports industry is gigantic. The amount of, you know, sports related um, economic activity is huge. The artists, I mean, I was talking to the De Young Museum uh, just this week. What is going to happen? When are museums ever going to open? It's going to take two years before museums can go back to any kind of normalcy. Nobody's going to go to museums. I don't think anybody's going to go to museums. Who, who will gratuitously, gratuitously go to get infected in large spaces? So what, what is the alternative? There's like every segment has to rethink those tweaks, those small tweaks that you're talking about. In some cases, big tweaks, especially for the large events part, it's big tweaks. The, you know, the music festivals, all summer long, there are great music festivals everywhere. It's summer is when Tanglewood comes together, and then we have music at Menlo here, and all over the world, people come together around music, and all these music festivals are getting canceled, and, and there is an economic cost to it, there's an emotional cost to it, and, and so on and so forth, but what is the future of all this? We don't know yet, and, and a lot of these organizations just don't have the capability to sustain themselves without, you know, these revenues. These are not like highly profitable places where they have a lot of, they squirrel away a lot of money. So this is a, this segment is actually facing one of the worst existential crises of our times. Now, to summarize a, a bit of, from a timeline point of view, I was thinking a few scenarios one of the key questions at the moment is, is there going to be a treatment or not? And by the end of May, there is going to be results of a bunch of trials, uh, especially two or three drug trials look promising and there could be, you know, something, some alleviation of the fear factor if there is good news on that front. But it's not guaranteed because I saw some of the remdesivir uh, trial data is just very minor. It's like reducing four days of hospital time, which helps the hospitals, but it doesn't really make feel, people feel particularly, you know, secure that they're not going to get infected and not land up in the hospital. So that's not a particularly encouraging trial. The one that, um, you know, we follow the, what's happening in France very closely. I'm married to a Belgian and, and we have a French-speaking households, so we can follow what's happening in that language. A lot of the, um, you know, south of France, Marseille, Dr. Uh, Didier Raoult, their results are much more encouraging, actually. But because Trump has been touting this drug, this has become a highly politicized affair, which is maddening, really. We want to hear what's happening on the science side. We don't, we are not interested in the politics of this drug, but but it is, it is what it is. It's the reality of the world is politics encumbers everything. So, so all, you know, regardless, let's say there is one inflection point at the end of May when we have some more data where we know, you know, whether we have a treatment to work with or not. 
which gives us a little bit of a ammunition to treat, to deal with things. The other thing is what you're talking about is uh, India and some other countries where things are uh, unknown right now. We don't really understand exactly what is going on here. Is this going to get out of hand? Is it not going to get out of hand? And if, you know, if the slums of India get out of hand, we are going to see a, oh boy, survival of the fittest of the worst kind this is going to be an absolute nightmare. So, so we are all bracing ourselves, holding our breath to see what happens there. Um, so, you know, I was thinking from a data science question point of view, in two years, there is going to be actual data. And that data is going to tell us things. One of the things this data is going to tell us, most likely, and I'm going to give you a scenario that I've been toying with, um, you know there's been a lot of community spread because of religious gatherings. So we are in the month of Ramadan right now, and there's a lot of imams who believe and who uh, spread that this, what's happening is due to the wrath of God, and they need to get together and, and do prayer meetings and, uh, you know, worship and, and give money to the imams so that all this, you know, settles down. Now, if we, I, I can guarantee if we look backwards two years later on the data, there's going to be a tremendous amount of the infection spread and the deaths that would be attributable directly to religious events. So if somebody wants to look at that and create a narrative around it that, you know, what is the basis of theology? This is a question that actually now has a data support, data to support it. So, so there are, there's going to be a lot of fundamentals that can be questioned and that can be uh, dealt with, thank you, uh, dealt with with data and data science. Uh, what, what are you thinking when, when you, right now we're trying to model and trying to predict, which is hard to do because there are so many unknowns, even basics are unknown, like whether kids get affected, whether young people get affected. Some young people are getting strokes right now, so the fact that we need to only protect the elderly and not the young people is, 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 is a false we don't know. The answer is we don't know. So, so there's one side of you as a data scientist, I'm sure, is you're wondering what's the, what do you do to predict. There's another part of you, I'm sure, that if, you know, as a computer scientist, I'm thinking, you know, when, when I have the data, these are the scenarios that I would model and, and try to see what's, uh, what that's telling us. And that starts to question a lot of humanity's fundamental beliefs. How do you uh, how do you think of this? So, having grown up in the household of an artist, so I have always been thinking about science in a much more of a holistic continuum coupled with society, and thinking about you know all the Russell, Romarola, Tagore, all of those lessons uh, which are philosophical in nature, but what does it tell you about civilization and what does it tell you about science? So a uh, couple of things. One thing I'd like to say is that we knew very little of this virus two months ago. And gradually, the knowledge has evolved, as you're seeing. And in two oh, years, sorry. we'll know a lot more. And we are yeah. learning at a very rapid uh, pace. So for example, yeah. I'm currently analyzing. So the case count and death counts do, would only tell you this much. You need, of course, individual level data in order to predict who is going to be hospitalized. Like the people who are having asymptomatic infections or mild symptoms to be managed at home, those are not our cons primary concern. We really need to predict who is going to the hospital and who is going to the ICU, who is getting uh, like a much more fatal outcome. So that work is really going on in terms of just agnostic exploration of the electronic health record data of all of these patients 
from the hospitals. I am involved in a project in Michigan where we are just mining completely to identify susceptible, vulnerable populations. Because that's where our, so I think that there is a lot of focus on drugs as it should be, but we really need to understand that treatment is a part of health, but prevention is also important. We cannot just go do whatever we like and then think of it just right. a treatment right. to cure us. So I think it yeah. has to be a balance between both and how to charter a path so that we know who are the high priority and the truly the highly susceptible thing. One thing that we learned about the virus is this microthrombia, that this coagulation, that the blood clots that are happening, sometimes it's happening at a more larger level, but these COVID dose and the other um, evidence that you're seeing, this is completely new. So I think medicine is moving at a very fast rate when we are seeing this unusual symptoms of uh, COVID uh, virus infection. So we are going to know a lot. So what I am interested in from a couple of things, because this is such a complex problem, as you pointed out, it is engulfing everything, society, uh, evolution, medicine, public health, economics, uh, mental health, so religion. So I'm really, uh, what the question that I want to look at is that really this massive uh, omnibus of data that we have, electronic health records, people's social belief, how do you define uh, environment? For many people, we have genetics. How to mine this in order to understand who are particularly mm -hmm. susceptible from not, not just from a genetics point of view. Some because of their occupation, they are frontline health workers and they're essential yeah. workers and at delivery stores. Some because of their genetics, some because of the comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, uh, kidney disease. Who should we protect first? Who should yep. we protect yep. first in order to reduce the fatality and then assume, yes, some of us are going to get it like flu, but we are going to be okay. And from that mm -hmm. point of view, we need to really eat healthy, practice our good lifestyle and behavioral choices so that we do not end up in that comorbidity cluster. So for me, this predicting the most vulnerable from a holistic societal perspective and be it religiosity, be it like, you know, poverty, be it genetics, be it uh, BCG vaccination in India, how to incorporate that in a big model so that I can protect and reduce human loss and suffering. I can integrate the data science, the agnostic and the hypothesis driven queries in order to minimize loss. So that's what I'm interested in. Yes, and uh, great. And, and uh, there are a few nuances that, that are very direct uh, in, in modeling when we can open up the economy reliably is when there is treatment available, that treatment is not going to be available at scale right away. So there will be prioritization needs. So you're going to have to determine which segments to protect, whether it's the frontline workers, of course, and then there's lots of other segments that are of vulnerability. And then there's if, when there's a vaccine. That's also going to, 7 billion people need to be vaccinated. That's not going to happen overnight. That's going to take time uh, to produce enough vaccines to do that. And there's going to be the politics of it. Uh, you know, the people who are the most vulnerable, who live in the closest quarters and are the most susceptible to community spread are the ones who are not going to get the vaccine because they can't afford the vaccine. And the politics and the economics of this of public health is going to take over. And the people who actually are perhaps less susceptible are going to get it first. So again, survival of the fittest is going to kick in gear and, and, and we're going to see devastation because of all of that. So I think we're looking at, you know, at least two years of dreadful times. Is that a reasonable conclusion? So I'd like to say that uh, maybe not two years of dreadful time, but really a different a modulated change in life is going to be different. Even if we reopen, until all of these questions are settled, life is going to be different. And another thing for us, uh, I would say that whose families are apart, uh, you know, my parents and my entire family is in India, and it's not clear when travel restrictions will be released. So the, so the whole world will probably be much more static and these types of wandering when you have your aging parents transatlantic and you cannot really go, that has a toll on human anxiety, stress, and we need yeah. not 
we don't One need to right now yes yeah so so we need to really pay attention to these things not just think about the bigger picture but at a micro level what humanity is undergoing and create support systems for that so sometimes it may be motivational interviewing, expressive writing. Uh, sometimes it could be amateurish musicians in my uh, apartment complex singing songs on a balcony. But we really need to rise to the occasion to give that uh, support, that uplifting, that elevation to each other. I think that cannot be undermined as we are going through this. We are all connected to this process and we are all suffering. So I think that coupled with science, I think that's very, very important. We are looking at a different way of life. The initial fear and anxiety is probably going to subside of death if we have a promising drug. But whether you're going to get the disease or not, whether the virus is going to be in your community or not, wearing masks is very challenging for some people to go out. But um, social distancing, having happy hours in a virtual way, all these things are difficult, but we have to practice because we just cannot risk the life of others and have to really persevere through. I also think that, you know, we have been so blessed. We have had so much comfort and we have never seen what our parents and grandparents sometimes have experienced. If you think about the Great Depression, then came the New Deal, which made America a better society. So uh, with this time, there are going to be changes and we are going to prioritize and we are going to think what is of great importance, what is most important to us. So my morale has been that, yes, it is going to be, we have to grind our teeth and go through this long haul when the virus curve will uh, peak and flatten and peak again. But I want humanity to be at its apex, thinking about what we have learned to treat each other with empathy and to really embrace a holistic view of society in terms of science, in terms of politics. I really want to see that elevation after these two years. Thank you, Pramor, on that note. Very well said, very uh, well put. Thank you for participating. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, and I, for entrepreneurs who are listening, yes, it's going to be tough. For the next two years, it's going to be really, really tough and things are going to be slow and things are going to be, you know, different. Things are going to be, uh, as it is, entrepreneur journeys are, are difficult, but now it's going to be a lot more difficult. So the, the message that I have for you entrepreneurs in this broader context is going back to something I wrote a long time ago in the, 2000, in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. I wrote a book called Bootstrapping Weapon of Mass Reconstruction. It is true that right now, funding is drying up. You know, and why? Because investors have already invested in companies and they need to make those companies survive. So before they take on new investment commitments, they're going to need to try to funnel money into the ones that, are, that they've already invested in that risk going under. So yes, there's going to be shortage of investment, and you are going to have to bootstrap. Most entrepreneurs will have to settle down into bootstrapping. I have always been of the opinion that bootstrapping is one of the best ways to build businesses. So, you know, three years later, when the economy settles down, if you have built a solid bootstrap business, very frugal, very tightly managed, you know, very full of empathy and, and good culture within your, business, within your employee base, because that's what keeps companies together, you know, bootstrap companies in particular, where money is not flowing like the Nile. You have to hold people together through good leadership, through good empathy, through taking care of your employees, taking care of your colleagues, taking care of one another. That's how companies hold together through tough times and with good vision. So you have to practice good leadership and build good bootstrap businesses. And those who will succeed in doing that, those who have the discipline and the, and the control, mental control over doing stuff like this, this takes a lot of mental control. So those of you who will succeed in doing that will emerge out of this as very strong companies and, and you will be able to go to great lengths because of that. And innovation is happening. Innovation will continue to happen. 
This is the time to rise to the occasion. So, Wilmot, thank you very much. I, if you need to go, you're uh, welcome to drop off. We will do a, an, an investor pitch next. And all the best to everyone listening. Thank you so much, Ramona. Bye-bye. Take care. Be safe. Folks, uh, we're going to switch to the entrepreneur pitch section. Um, we have, I just want to set a little bit of uh, expectation here, which is this is a safe working session. We have absolutely no other agenda but to help you move forward. So don't be defensive. Don't be afraid. This is basically we're on your side is the point. Now, if you disagree with feedback that you get here, that's fine too. I don't particularly have a problem with your disagreeing with, with anything that we have to say here. It's your venture, you are going to make the decisions, and that is really your prerogative. So, we are going to start with Jacob from London. Jacob, please unmute your line and tell us what you're working on. Hi, Sharona. How are you doing? Can you hear me okay? Good. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, so, I've been working on a company called Stasher for the last four years. Uh, it's a company I started when I was a student with one of my friends um, whose shoulder you could see <laughs> in the previous picture. Um, so, Anthony and I, when we moved to London, he was living really centrally and he often found that people uh, were asking him if they could store stuff at his home. And mm -hmm. the more we looked into this, the more we realized there was a genuine problem around storage in cities. And the only solution at the time were some station lockers, but there weren't very many left and they were expensive. And we figured that we could do something a bit better by building a platform where people could book storage in shops and hotels. And the reason we pick shops and hotels in particular, uh, but it, it, it works for almost any business, is that they have good opening hours, they have some security and like CCTV, but mainly they were really keen to make ancillary revenues. And I do wonder, given the sort of current climate, if that's going to be an even bigger trend as we come out of the sort of post, um, well, as we enter the sort of post COVID world. But just to give you a sort of picture of how it works, that's that's the business. It's uh, a platform where people can book sh uh, book storage. And yes, you've got the slides up there, perfect. Um, the kind of people we're targeting are travelers, event goers, Airbnb guests, everyone who has basically been really badly affected <laughs> in the last uh, couple of months um, by, by the pandemic. But uh, we did have quite a nice, um, uh, almost product market fit, I'd say, going on before then, because um, you know we've, we've served nearly half a million people. Um, the marketplace uh, connects these people. You've got the hosts in the middle, the customers who are looking for storage, and the referral partners are generally, this is just one of our, uh, our marketing channels, but generally a lot of travel companies, Airbnb hosts, uh, the kind of people who have customers in their journey who will need storage, they refer to us. So we've built up this quite nice ecosystem. Um, our priority was always around simplicity and scalability. The tech is designed to be really quick and easy to book. It's half the price of the station lockers. We've had quite a good um, success with scaling uh, just because we found a lot of inbound requests work really well. Hotels and shops um, hear about it from other shops and sign up to the platform and we make it quite easy to onboard. And one of the things we did just to bind it all together was an insurance platform, sorry, an insurance product offering that means all bags are insured. That's a quick graph of our traction. Um, so in truth, uh, we probably take about half that because um, we, we split commissions 50-50 with the hosts, but we were seeing really nice growth rates last year into 2019. We tripled uh, in, in, uh, in revenue and actually in, in all our sort of main KPIs. We were hoping to achieve it again. That definitely won't happen. <laughs> but um, <laughs> What do you charge? What did you charge to get to this 12, 2 million revenue? What was the pricing model? Sure. It's six uh, in the UK, six pounds in the US, six dollars per bag per day. Um, your typical customer will store two bags. It will normally be 
uh, more than one person sort of together. And um, yeah, it's, it's a sort of high frequency model. So it's really low cost to operate because it's really just the platform um, and the insurance cost. And the marketing costs have also been really cheap because we've done it all by referral or organic. We've done a little bit of paid advertising with Google, but it's the, the cost of acquisition is quite high. So in order to keep that profitable, uh, we, we haven't done too much of it. Yeah, there are some stats. I think I've, I've given you most of these already, Jacob, actually. Jacob, what, um, uh, what is the size of your operation on the, you know, how many people are you and how do you manage this business? Sure. So there's now 20 of us, although that's, it's gone up from about 14 last year because we did a funding round in January. So we're 20 at the moment. Um, for the first two years, it was really just me and my co-founder. And then we raised some funding in 2018. Uh, and that was when we did a first wave of hiring. and We've just done another funding round. And so we're doing our second wave of hiring. Well, we were. We were in the middle of our second wave of hiring. And that's, as I say, it's sort of all on pause at the moment. But the timing was how very much, lucky. In. How much cash do you have? Uh, so we raised uh, $2 million uh, back in um, uh, back in January. So uh, we've, we've still got most of that. Um, but obviously, right now, it's it's not a good time for revenues. So we, we're kind of hibernating at the moment until travel picks up again. And we're, we're looking at other ideas or ways that we can use the audience that we've built up um, in the meantime or the product. So... <clears throat> There, you know, there is a this timeline discussion that we just had um, applies to you more than most people because this is a sector mm. that is directly impacted, right? So, really, is, people yeah. are not going to travel, people are not going to, people are going to freeze, and and people have frozen. People are going to continue to remain frozen until we we get this thing under control to some extent. So, mm. in the next two years you're going to need to figure out, either you have to figure out a segment that continues to travel and continues to do stuff like that, and, and, and whether your hosts are going to be comfortable letting strangers come into their places and so on and so forth. So mm. there's like lots of, lots of problems, um, you know, in, in both sides of your marketplace. And, and by the way, Viva Srivastava from the audiences is giving you a big pat on the back, and that's absolutely well deserved. You have. Uh, thank you. Yes, you I'm just built, sure. That's very kind of you to say. <laughs> <laughs> under normal circumstances, you've built a wonderful business with a sound concept, and, and it's, you know, should have gone on to great heights, but you have been hit by a black oh, swan. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we have, yeah. Which now we have so to true. figure out how to take in stride. So, so there are a few options. One is. Um, you, the pivot, you clearly need to do some sort of a pivot, and the question is, what level pivot should you consider? Um, if both hosts and the people who are storing luggage are frozen, then this particular value proposition is not going to work. Mm. But you do have a community of people who have been using your stuff. So one, one starting point could be you should talk to these people, people who are heavy-duty users of your service. Talk to these people and mm -hmm. see if there anything else that they want to do that you might be able to use your platform to enable. There is a mm – -hmm. you clearly mm -hmm. need a pivot. There is no question for the next two years, next three years, you're going to need a pivot. What is that pivot? Yeah, I think – I, I fear you're right. I think I've sort of gone through um, all the different phases that you go through. It's like the sort of phases of grief, isn't it? Where you, you're sort of a little bit in denial for a bit and you think, oh, it'll come back eventually. But I, we've got to the point now where we've decided let's, let's really cut down on all the costs. We're, we're lucky in the UK because we have this, um, uh, this scheme. I think it's a little bit like the PPP one in America, but we... So we've been able to keep all our employees on, on furlough for the moment, but we'll have to decide what to do with them uh, when that ends. But yeah, we're, we're now looking quite seriously at how we can use the network. Can we, you know, we've got 200,000 emails of, of young travelers, um, but yeah. obviously there's not that many people looking to target that demographic just now. So it really 
it depends when travel comes back. But uh, as you say, I think, yeah, we, we're definitely looking at sort of how we can pivot what we've got at the moment, because I, 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 I think to be on the safe side, you don't want to assume travel's coming back even this year, you know? Like, I don't think so. I think you should be planning from a planning purpose. This is why I wanted to have the timeline discussion today. Um, and I've been trying to, you know, provide guidance to our community on timeline. It's better to be realistic. The next two years are going to be really difficult travel-wise. I think gratuitous yeah. travel is gone. Only essential travel is going to happen. So gratuitous travel is gone. And um, when it comes to essential travel, well, how does that play into your um, offering? Does that have applicability? And if not, then how do you sustain the next two years? What what can you do to pivot? So this is a this is the, your business is one of, is squarely in that segment that needs to pivot and needs to pivot out of this somehow. So yeah, um, absolutely. And I think you need to drop your burn rate. The good news is you do have a couple of million dollars in hand to work through this two years. You can make a. $2 million is a lot of money. It can go for a long time to keep things going. You, you, you have to basically, you know, get your burn rate down such that you can make that $2 million last the next two years. But in the meantime, mm. you also have to think through what is it that you're going to do for the next two years that is going to make you money. Absolutely. I think, yeah, that's, that's exactly kind of, that's uh, what we've been thinking for the last few weeks. So um, hopefully, yeah, hopefully we'll have some kind of a breakthrough. But um, uh, but I couldn't agree with you more. I think I think you've really said it correctly. You know, the other thing that I, the other pointer I want to give you is I'm you know I'm thinking on my feet right now, listening to you and trying to come up with ideas that I can you know give sure, you so that it. you can do those. Um, you have twelve hundred hosts who are doing this for a reason. They need the extra income. They want the extra income. They need the extra income. So mm -hmm. one right place where you can go to get ideas is to talk to those hosts and see what they're doing right now to make ends meet. And how can you help those people? You know, because if there is something that they want to do that is that applies to these times and these dynamics, then helping them and amplifying that may be a way to put your marketplace to work. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Because the need is on, you know, the travelers, they are on discretionary decision-making process. The young travelers, they stop traveling, big deal. You know, it is a pleasure thing. Mostly, maybe maybe some of it is business travel, but all of it is kind of discretionary. But on the host side, most likely these people are doing this because they need the extra money. So they mm -hmm. have the more pressing need. So I would start your exploration of where do you pivot to by interviewing the hosts first, not the not the guests. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. So, so go dig in and see what what you what they have to say, and I I think we will learn something through that process. Thank you. Yes, I will do. All right. Good luck. Stay safe. Thank you. Nice to nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you too. All right. Um, Malka, you're next from Colombo, Sri Lanka. Yeah. Hi, Shramana. Hello. Hi. Hello. What are you working on? Yeah. Uh, uh, hi, I'm Al Kamalatunga and I'm from Colombo, Sri Lanka. And my idea is at the concept level yet. The idea is for a gifting and a sharing application. There are two main components <laughs> called human and physical uh, physical components. Next slide, please. Yeah. If I'm talking about the physical gift component, there are people who like to donate, but these days it is very hard for anybody to go out and donate. Even I have some used items, but we don't have free cycling or charity shops to donate them. 
using a platform like this you can use a delivery medium and share those things or get what you want and for the uh, and for the people who wants to involve only through online transactions they can pay for shipping and help someone else get a gift or else they can pay for this site next slide next slide please hello next slide the next slide is up Uh, the other part is human gift component. I think this part is very important these days. Everybody likes to have a casual chat so that they will be able to have a different perspective or share knowledge, or most importantly, for stress relieving. Especially this part will be able to help elderly people since they are housebound during the pandemic. And I have added a dating part because this will help people who don't want to use Tinder like app. In my country, dating is very hard these days. <laughs> Not only these days, it is very hard always. People even put paper advertisements as marriage proposals. And the volunteer um, part I have... Marka, let's stay on the side for a moment and I want to give you a bit of feedback. Okay. Successful businesses do well when you pick a certain type of customer, a certain segment of customers. Uh -huh. Whereas here you're talking about so such a diverse customer base. You're talking about elderly people who need a casual chat because they're lonely and they want to connect to people who like, young people who like to date. These are two diverse segments. I would like you to pick one segment and design a product or a service to that segment. So your point is well taken. People are lonely. There are a lot of elderly people who are lonely, and if they're homebound, they're very lonely because there's, you know, this is a very difficult time, and, and people are going to, for the next few years, it's going to be really difficult because people are going to have limited activities and so on and so forth. So now is a good time to explore um, how to deal with people's loneliness with this casual chat? Are people willing to pay for talking to other people? This is, this is a reasonable hypothesis, and, and maybe you should build your business around that, because I don't like this very diverse business ideas. I think you should pick one business idea and do one thing and one thing really well. OK. Uh, the other uh, the uh, uh, all the things, sorry of all the things that you've said so far, this idea of people being lonely and wanting to chat and are willing to pay pay to chat with somebody seems to me like a good idea. Okay, um, the custom acquisition mainly done through social media marketing. And also we can ask our gifties, gifters, and gift enablers to spread the word also. And I also have plans to collaborate with churches and other charities as well. Uh, uh, these are some ideas to improve the custom experiences, like using filters like this. Uh, uh, can you go to the other slide, please? Yeah, the, uh, these are the filters for a gifty part. The other slide. I think this gifting idea I don't buy into. Okay. The only idea of all the things that you've told me here, the only idea that buy into is that people may be willing to pay to talk to other people because there's tremendous loneliness and, and, and in this state of limited mobility and limited you know, freedom to do things, go out and do things. This may be human loneliness is peaking, and and because human anxiety is also peaking, the combination of loneliness and anxiety makes people want to talk to people, and people may be willing to pay to do that. You have to test it, but I think that is a reasonable hypothesis to move forward with. Okay. Um, so I would encourage you to go build your you know, do the rest of your exploration on this idea, using that idea as your hypothesis, and then start figuring out how you're going to build this business. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
Um, looks like there's one more who wants to pitch. Do you have? Uh, yeah, we'll do another pitch. Sure, one more slides. Go ahead. Uh, Maureen, why don't you go ahead and upload on more slides. While you're doing that, I'm going to explain to people how to use One Million by One Million, and then we'll come back to Anmol's uh, presentation. So if you like what we're doing here, please refer One Million by One Million to other serious entrepreneurs who, are, who understand that this is really difficult to do. As you can see in the presentation that we just saw from Jacob earlier, he was running a very nice business that had all the characteristics of success in it and then gets hit by something that is so massive that he has to rethink everything. And that is, this is a you know, much more serious degree of disruption, but entrepreneurs have to deal in resilience. That is the, the key success factor in an entrepreneur's life is resilience, is perseverance, is persistence. So if you have that characteristic, that is the single characteristic that is going to make you a successful entrepreneur. There are many other characteristics, but that's one that is a must. So if you have that, then there, we can teach you methodology. We can give you resources with which to, to learn to put one foot before the other. So. If you want to do entrepreneurship and if you want to learn how to put one foot before the other, one by one com is a very good place to start your learning journey. There is a blog that is free and is very rich. You can learn from that. You can learn from the Entrepreneur Journeys book series. You can learn from these roundtables. We have them every week, and the recordings are all available on YouTube. You can join the full acceleration program, which is one by one Premium. We offer you extensive methodology guidance. We have a full digital curriculum. We help you with business development. We give you strategy consulting in private roundtables. We also help you with financing. I suggest you take your idea and go to the self-assessment. This is a free tool available on our blog, on our website, and ask yourself these questions. These are the questions that investors would ask you. You should ask these questions of yourself. If you get stuck, go study 1M by 1M Basics. This is our digital curriculum. It's a case study-based curriculum, and it will help you learn methodology. Learning methodology is really, really important. Shooting blind is not helpful. There is a method to entrepreneurship, and we are in 21st century internet age. There is a tremendous amount of learning that you can do without shooting from the hip, without shooting blind. So do the learning, learn the methodology before you make a lot of mistakes that are perfectly avoidable. Um, we have a lot of description of the program, premium program, basic program on the website. Go dig around and see if this is what you want to use to learn. The curriculum is described in great detail. It is a case study-based curriculum. You know, you can just start reading case studies. Go to our website, one by one com. Go to Entrepreneur Journeys, which is our case study section. And every day, read five case studies. Put an entry in your Google Calendar or Apple Calendar or whatever calendar you use. Block out one hour to go study five case studies. Do this for 30 days, and at the end of 30 days, you would have gotten into the head of 150 entrepreneurs who have built successful businesses. You have time right now. What this is going to simulate is an experience of having a coffee with 150 entrepreneurs or having lunch with 150 entrepreneurs. You have gotten into the heads of 150 successful entrepreneurs and you will feel two things. You will feel inspired. You will feel confident. You will feel a spiritual lift, which all of us need right now. You will also feel like you are learning methodology. Methodology helps you feel empowered. When you know that there are tricks to doing this, when you know there are strategies of doing this right, 
When you learn those strategies, you feel empowered. So you want to feel inspired, you want to feel empowered, do this for 30 days, and I guarantee you, you're going to feel much better about your entrepreneurial journey and you will have a much better set of ammunition to do this with. And then you can decide how you want to use the one and by one in resources. Our methodology is lean, capital efficient, bootstrap startups. Our philosophy is bootstrap first, raise money later. Right now, bootstrapping is going to be your biggest friend. Funding is going to be slow. Some companies will get funded, but you have to have reached that point to get funded. And if you haven't, then right now, bootstrapping is your only bet. That's it. We have um, three roundtables coming up May 14th, 21st, and 28th. And uh, you're welcome to join any of those. We also have online rendezvous on LinkedIn Live, Facebook Live, and Twitter Live on May 12th, 19th, and 26th. Those are Tuesday morning, 8 a.m. Pacific time. Um, I want to, I'm going to go to Anmol's slides in a moment. Um, I want to introduce you to Irina Patterson. If you have questions about 1 million by 1 million, you can email Irina and she'll be happy to talk with you by phone, Skype, email, whatever. Um, let us look at Anmol's pitch. Anmol, are you on the phone? Yes, ma'am. Yes, go ahead, Hello. please. Hello, ma'am. How are you? Am I Good. Remember? How are you? Where are you joining from? Ma'am, I'm from India. Uh, Where about? India. New Delhi? Yes, ma'am. All right. What are you doing? Tell us. Ma'am, uh, basically, Opebo, ma'am, we have incorporated this company on February uh, 2020. And uh, we got DIPP recognition from Ministry of Commerce and Industry Government of India on March. Ma'am, basically, this uh, startup is for providing one-stop solutions for every household uh, in different segments and in different areas. Uh, like, we would be providing security services as well as medical services, legal services, everything. And ma'am, we will provide employment to the individuals who are not literate. We would first provide them literacy by collaborating with government agencies. And uh, we will, after, ma'am, as we all know that uh, this uh, coronavirus period, uh, it will uh, unemploy many people. Ma'am, after this will get yeah. over, many people would get unemployed. And we will be providing employment opportunities to each of them. Ma'am, like in India, you know that uh, uh, many are illiterate. Most of them are illiterate. And we would be uh, providing them training courses for multi-skills in order to generate their revenue for, from their local. Like if any individual is giving a haircut. Okay, ma'am? And he is uh, generating uh, uh, revenue from hair cutting. And suppose the uh, op job opportunity is not available at any moment, then he might be driving, he might be serving uh, in some other sectors, and this way he can generate his revenue. And uh, meanwhile, he will also be learning from government, and he will be get getting the certificates of graduation. In our, uh, and also, ma'am, we would be generating employment for local vendors such as uh, companies, organizations, MNCs. Ma'am, uh, I cannot explain you in brief, ma'am, because I'm not having the slides and I'm quite nervous too, ma'am. Uh, Don't be nervous, you know. Anmol. I Let me give you a, a bit of guidance on how to think about it. You are a very new company. so. Um, you have the flexibility because you haven't even really started. You have the flexibility to 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 structure this right. And and I think one of the things I would like you to do is to learn some methodology. Um, if you want to, I, I'll repeat what I said just now, is if you want to build a business, you have to take something that is a manageable problem and solve that well. 
you can't do all the things that you're talking about doing in a business context because it costs yeah. too much money. You're going to have to do something that is manageable that you can make money from. Without that, there is no business. So yes, you can't teach nursing to legal, to consultancy, to blah, 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 to hairdressing. It's just too much, too much. So figure out where you want to focus. Where do you have an unfair advantage? And I would like yes. you to do what I said earlier. Yes, ma'am. Is, is go study some case studies and start following the program a bit to learn. Because I don't think yes. you're ready to start this business. You can incorporate the business, but I don't think you have the knowledge to start a business that is likely to succeed yet. You're going to, start, you're going to need to start framing the problem into something manageable. Right now, what you have is too big two all over the place and it's not going to work. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, I want to ask something. Like, ma'am, we yeah? have not generated uh, any revenue uh, because of lockdown. And as we have a newly startup, newly incorporated startup, ma'am, but uh, during lockdown, we can do one thing that we can engage uh, a, an individual uh, like uh, any student or uh, anyone to teach their juniors and this way the juniors will be getting the teachings online teachings ma'am is it uh, ma'am could it be considered yeah that may be a that may be a way that may be a business to build but you should then just build that business that where seniors teach juniors online and that's all you do don't try to do 55 different things and that's going to be unmanageable. So if you want to do that business where seniors are going to see juniors and you create a marketplace around that concept, that's fine. But just do that. Okay, ma'am. Sure, ma'am. Okay. Ma yes, All right. Uh, does Thank anybody you. have any questions? This is a, now is a good time to ask questions. If anybody wants to ask any questions before we adjourn, I am very happy to answer. We have time today to answer questions. If you don't have any questions, then I will adjourn. All right, I don't see any questions. In that case, I will adjourn the session for today and we will see you next time. Um, times are tough. I don't want to misrepresent that times are not tough. And, you know, a lot of businesses are going through the kind of immense challenge that we saw in Jacob's situation. I think unmoved situation is different. Malka's situation is different. They're just starting out. They haven't you know, they haven't really put all of themselves in yet. They have, they're just in the very early stages of thinking about starting something. They haven't really started. Whereas Jacob's situation is he's fully in this business and, and the business has completely, the business environment has completely changed, which is in a way tragic. But I think Jacob is a very good entrepreneur and, and there are many other entrepreneurs out there like Jacob who are, who have the strength and the, the intellectual capacity to deal with all this and the spiritual capacity to deal with all this. So, you know, we are here, we will be here talking to you as much as you want every week, multiple times a week. So please take advantage of that. And to the extent we can help you, please reach out and we will do our best. We will be here. As long as we are not sick, we will be here. See you soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you for coming today. All the best.